Good morning and welcome to the online streaming service of Catawba Springs Christian Church. I'm Pastor Brent Niedergall and we would like to welcome any visitors we have joining us and also wish our moms a happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to you and we have a gift we wish we could give you uh, today. We won't be able to do that unfortunately but next Sunday we are praying that the Lord will give us good weather that we can have an outdoor service together at 9 30. We're planning on this being an hour-long service uh, during which time we'll have music and we'll observe the Lord's Supper and Pastor Woodruff will be preaching and the plan is to have that next Sunday at 9 30. If you could, if you haven't already, there's a survey our church secretary Mary sent out to give us an idea of how many people to plan on having so we can set up chairs for that. If you could fill that out. Uh, if you don't have access to internet or aren't able to do that, you could call the church and let us know also so we'd have an idea. But we'll have extra chairs set up regardless so that we'll have a place for you. Uh, next Sunday, 9.30. Be praying for good weather. And also, if you'd pray that the Lord will speed along phase one quickly and phase two so that we can be back to meeting uh, as normal as we used to do as soon as possible. Uh, we have a bridal shower tomorrow at, from 3 to 5. We'd like to remind you about for Natalie Pierce. I'm sure she would love to see your face uh, from a safe distance, of course. Tomorrow, that's 3 to 5 here at the church. And now Pastor Mac is going to lead us in some singing, and there'll be some special music before Pastor Woodruff brings a message from God's Word for us today. Thank you, Pastor Brent, and happy Lord's Day and happy Mother's Day to you all as well. We're looking forward to being together this morning, singing a little bit, and then hearing a uh, ministry of song by Lori Beachel and Alicia Beachel before Pastor comes. We're going to be singing two hymns this morning, and some of you have hymn books. It's uh, number 527, Revive Us Again, and 361, Wider Than Snow. And uh, let's sing a couple of verses each. Let's open up with a word of prayer first, and then we'll get into our singing. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be together in this way. Lord, we thank you that you have provided a way for us to be able to, from a distance, so to speak, be able to worship together. And Lord, we thank you for that opportunity. We thank you for the opportunity of, of next week and the possibility is of meeting together on the 17th of May. And Lord, we pray that you would give wisdom and uh, give all the knowledge that we need. And Lord, we depend on you for the weather as well as you lead us. Uh, into those opportunities. We're very, very grateful. Thank you for the opportunity we have to worship together. And Lord, may the words of the songs and the message of the ministry of song and then the word of God, Lord, do a special work in our hearts this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, first, revive us again. Let's do a couple of stanzas. <laughs> Scripture that uh, when it comes to a storm, even in the Lord Jesus, he was always leading his disciples through the storm. Not only was his presence there, but he actually led us through those storms. And this storm that we've been through needs to warm our hearts. We need to be different because 
of what the Lord has led us through and allowed us to, to experience. So let's sing Whiter Than Snow, a plea to the Lord for his cleansing in our hearts, his revival creating in us new hearts as well. 361, Whiter Than Snow. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Thou wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, thou seest, I patiently wait. Come now and within me a new heart create. To those who have sought thee, thou never saidst no.
good day to you and a happy Mother's Day. What a special day it is. I don't know how you woke up this morning. Maybe you um, ran into your mom's room and, and grabbed her if you were uh, a younger child and uh, just hugged her and kissed her and, and expressed your your love to her. Maybe maybe some of you of your families you got up early and you actually uh, made breakfast for mother and served her in the bed this morning. I don't know. You might have other things uh, planned out for the day. But uh, we are so appreciative of our moms. I trust you are. Uh, there might even be some who really didn't know their mom, but everybody had a mother with only two exceptions, Adam and Eve. And so today I wanted to take the time to look at a text of scripture that speaks about a mother and some lessons we can learn from her life. So if you have your Bible, I'd like to turn you this morning to Matthew chapter 20. And looking down to verse 20, I'm going to read you through verse 23 this morning. And then uh, for the evening message, I have a part two to this. And we'll come back to this text. But this morning, just looking for these few verses and asking for the Holy Spirit's understanding and application. So begin in verse 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? And she saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on the right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. And Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of the cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not for mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, as we would take these next few moments, we ask that you'll settle our hearts and our thoughts to focus on our Savior, the author and finisher of our faith, and that we would allow your Spirit to open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of thy law. Teach us today from your holy word. We thank you for keeping us for protecting us. Lord, we don't know what the week holds, but we're thankful you hold the week. And we know you hold the hearts of men in your hands, Father, that you're in control. And we do pray for the continued uh, peace through the circumstances that we find ourselves in, whether it be individually or as families or as a state or as a nation. Father, even as we think of our, uh, our setting in the whole world, uh, we know that you love us, you gave us your Son, and may we be assured of his presence as believers in Christ, that he'll never leave nor forsake us. And may we, God, today, as we would look to the scriptures, be enlightened and rejoice with the gifting of mothers. Uh, what a blessing to have a mother and for maybe some who didn't have a mother for those that were motherly to them maybe an aunt maybe uh, a neighborly friend who became like a mother a teacher maybe becoming like a mother God we thank you for those uh, that were used in such a way in our lives and so may uh, we rejoice in the day and look forward uh, to the blessing of your word to our hearts and we ask all this in Christ's name amen well, uh, what a blessing to have moms. And uh, as I mentioned, every one of us has a mom. And if you're able to today, I trust that you'll take some time to visit with your mom. Maybe she's not nearby to where you can go and see her. But uh, get on the phone, chat with her. Maybe she's got a smartphone. You could actually Skype or FaceTime with her. if She's got a device that can do that. But spending time with her, if you're able be sure to put your arms around your mom and give her a hug 
and whisper into her ear your love and appreciation for all that she has uh, done for you, continues maybe to do for you. And uh, maybe if you uh, can't hold your mom, um, you would be sure to at least express uh, your uh, love for her in some way uh, by the phone or some kind of a, a letter that you could write to her. Uh, for some of us, this is a different year. Um, we were used to having our moms with us and um, they're not uh, any longer around. Uh, I understand that. Uh, my mom uh, left uh, this earthly home for her heavenly home a number of years ago. In fact, I, I was uh, just looking at her picture this morning. I thought I would uh, bring it and just show you a picture of my mom. Uh, this is uh, uh, BC, before children. Uh, in fact, uh, she was 18 years old when that picture was taken, and um, uh, I am just so thankful for my mom. Uh, I was thinking of the setting my mom made for us in our home growing up, and uh, you know, some of us uh, really had uh, some pretty straight-laced upbringing. And uh, I read a, a little ditty the other day about the meanest mother, and I thought I'd read it to you this morning. It might strike a chord with some of us, uh, others, maybe not, but listen as I read this to you. It's called The Meanest Mother. I had the meanest mother in the world. While other children ate candy for breakfast, I had to have cereal, eggs, and toast. When others had Coke and candy for lunch, I had to eat a sandwich with carrot sticks and celery sticks as well. My mother insisted on knowing where I was at all times. She had to know who my friends were and what we were doing. She insisted that if I told her I would be gone for an hour, I would be gone for an hour or less. I'm ashamed to admit it, but she actually had the nerve to make us children learn how to work. We had to wash dishes, we had to sweep the floors, we had to clean our bedrooms and make our beds, we had to learn how to cook and even work out in the yard. I believe she stayed up awake at night just thinking of things she could do with us the next day. Well, the meanest, meanness didn't stop there. She would wake us children out of a dead sleep on Sunday mornings to go to church. And if that wasn't enough, she made us miss the wonderful world of Disney on Sunday night just so she could take us back to the Sunday night service at church. By the time I became a teenager, she had grown meaner. She embarrassed me by making my dates come to the front door to pick me up. And while my friends were dating at the mature ages of 12 and 13, my old-fashioned mother refused to let me date until I graduated from high school at the age of 18. In spite of the harsh way that I was raised, I've never been arrested. And all my siblings, well, we all turned out okay. You know, I guess we owe much to our mean mother. She insisted that we grow up into a God-fearing, honest, responsible adult. I'm grateful to God that he gave me one of the meanest mothers in the world. Well, I don't know if you would describe your mom as mean, but mothers have an incredible impact on our lives. I was thinking of several men who made notation of that. The father of our country, George Washington, said this, the greatest teacher I ever had was my mother. All that I am and all that I ever hope to be, I owe to my mother. No man is poor when he has a godly mother, Abraham Lincoln said. Another gentleman said, men are what their mothers make them. We can sure see from our text in Matthew chapter 20 that mothers are highly impactful upon the lives of their children, whether for good or bad or both. And this morning I want to look at this text here in Matthew and preach a message to you about a godly mother's desire for her children. You know, I can't think of any mother in her right mind who really wouldn't want for her child to be successful, uh, to attain some kind of special greatness. Excuse me. This mother that we read of here 
the mother of James and John, her name Salome, was no different. And in her ambitious request for the Lord Jesus, we learn of what true greatness really is and how and why to obtain it. So I want to look at here this morning a mother's desire for her children. And the Holy Spirit's recorded these words, I think, for us to learn some important truths about what God really considers to be greatness. I'm going to give you one of two points. The second one will be in the evening service, but this morning I want to look at first a mother's ambition. I want to see three points of this, sub-points. Her first is the description of the mother. It's, it's just the mother of Zebedee's children. Now we know as we study the New Testament, the Gospels, we find out that Salome is this woman. She is the mother of uh, James and John. Uh, she is the wife to Zebedee. Her name Salome comes from uh, the Hebrew word that we discussed from Wednesday night's prayer and Bible study time. Remember we're talking about Jehovah Shalom. Uh, Salome is a form of that word for Shalom. So the name speaks of peace or if you would peacefulness. Uh, a very interesting name that uh, uh, she uh, is known as peaceful when she raised two boys that the Lord Jesus Christ described as sons of thunder. Um, she must have been quite the mother. Uh, being married to Zebedee, a fisherman, uh, we don't find any place in the New Testament where she was unfaithful, so she must have been a faithful mom, a faithful wife, uh, certainly patient, you know, being a uh, wife of a fisherman and two sons who were also following in their father's footsteps, she'd have to have a lot of patience, you know, to go fishing takes a lot of patience and I can imagine she was sitting at home waiting for her boys and uh, her husband to come home uh, from long nights or long days of fishing. Per perhaps you may recall that Salome was Mary, the mother of Jesus, was Mary's sister. Uh, as you study through the text of the scriptures, you'll find that she is the sister to Mary, which would make her, if you would, the aunt in earthly relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's this aunt coming to speak to the Lord. And as we read uh, the scriptures here, you find that in verse 20, she's not introduced by her proper name, Salome. She's not introduced as the wife of Zebedee. She's not introduced as the mother of the sons of thunder. And she's not even introduced as Jesus' favorite aunt. Not that he had a favorite aunt, but that's not how she's introduced. She's just introduced this way. The mother of Zebedee's children. The mother. Boy, is that not a mouthful of a title? <laughs> mother. And then the second portion of her description here, the mother of Zebedee's children. Were not those sons a handful, as Jesus describes them as sons of thunder? Wow. And from Matthew chapter 20, we see this mother has a very keen interest and we don't know necessarily if it was her that asked the question first of the Lord Jesus or her sons. Because in the corollary text of Mark chapter 10, James and John ask the same question of the Lord. If they can have these positions of the right and left hand. Positions of honor, positions of authority. But we can safely say from Matthew's account what keenly interested her sons, keenly interested in her. It was an interest of her. Or if you would, reverse that. What keenly interested her, keenly interested her sons. Which leads me to a second point. Not only her description, 
But let me get a little deeper with it. Her devotion, as verse 20 says, she comes with her sons and she's worshiping him. She's giving him adoration and praise. She understands who he is. In fact, as we see here in Matthew chapter 20, that she is worshiping him. We also find over in Mark chapter 15, when the Lord Jesus was crucified, she was one of the women present, not up close to the cross, but as a distance, the scriptures tell us there in Mark 15, that at a distance she was there. She viewed the crucifixion of the Savior. And then you'll find, as Mark chapter 16 goes on to tell us, she was one of the women that came with the others that resurrection morning to anoint the body of the Lord Jesus. And then, of course, the angel appeared before them and told them, he's not here, he's risen. Go tell the disciples. And she's one of those women with the others running to announce the good news of the resurrection. Folks, there's no pretense of her faith. It's the genuine thing. She knows the Lord. She reminds me of Timothy's mom. As you remember, Paul comments about Timothy's mom. He says, I recall in your mother this unfeigned faith. That's Salome. She was the genuine thing. She was real. And when she comes worshiping and desirous of her sons, it's real. It's real. And I couldn't help but be reminded of of uh, two sons of many, 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 many years later by the name of John and Charles Wesley. They lived in the 18th century and how these two godly young men so powerfully impacted that island of England with the gospel and then as well abroad with their, their ministries of music and the preaching and teaching of God's word let me make this comment about their mother, Susanna Wesley. It was recorded of her that her life's rule was to never spend more time in any matter of mere recreation in one day than she spent in private religious duties. She was the real thing. What a godly woman she was and how she powerfully impacted those two sons of hers. You know, we need godly mothers to powerfully impact the children they have. We need them to, to impact the, 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 the family that God has blessed them with, whether it's their immediate family or the family of the church. As Paul mentioned in 1 Timothy chapter 2, impacting others by their adorning themselves in modest apparel and with shamefacedness, with sobriety, impacting their family and the church family with good works, that they are, they are a woman that, that learns in silence with all subjection, not a woman usurping authority over the man. That they're like Proverbs chapter 31 there as the scriptures record that, that she's a woman that her heart can safely trust in her and so that he has no need of spoil when he entrusts her with whatever. That she will do him good and not evil all the days of his life. That she will be a woman that feareth the Lord, Proverbs 31, 30. That she will be a mature woman that her behavior is becoming of holiness, not a false accuser, not given to much wine, uh, a teacher of good things, one that teaches young women to be sober and to love their husbands and to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, a keeper at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. As in Titus, Paul would write to Titus to, to challenge these women of the church, these mothers to be such. Oh, Salome was, was a woman of great devotion to the Lord. She lived it. She was the real thing. But thirdly, and lastly, I want you to see her desire. As you look back to verse 20, she comes worshiping, verse 20, the latter half, it says, and desiring a certain thing of him. 
Hey moms, are you desiring a certain thing of the Lord today? When I say mom, I'm implying what you desire for your children. What is it that you are desiring? A certain thing, something specifically that you're desiring for your children. Interesting, this word desire, as you see it there in the text, it, it could be interpreted to beg, to call for, to crave, or as it's here translated, desire. It's the same word that's over in Luke chapter 23. In the context there of verse 25, the Jews have persuaded the common people, instead of asking for the release of Jesus, they say, beg for Barabbas to be released. The same word. Hours later, the crucifixion has taken place Jesus has finished his work and he dies there on the cross. As you remember, there were two men who came for the body. But before they could get the body from the Roman soldiers, they first had to approach Pilate. And one of those men, Joseph of Arimathea, Luke chapter 23, later on in the chapter, verse 52, it says that he came to Pilate and he begged him for the body. It's the same word. So this is a serious request. This is an earnest request. It's a present active tense that's used here. This is something that she is persisting with, with him, desiring, I really want this. I really desire this for my sons. You know, when I was a, a young boy uh, and wanting something from my dad and concerned that I probably wouldn't get it if I approached him, I would ask of my mom. My mom made a great spokesperson. Um, she, she was loving and compassionate and knew how to approach my dad. She was tactful and persuasive with him. She was understanding and wise. Uh, my mom, just just amazing, and uh, I'm sure you could agree. As you uh, grew up with a mom, and knowing your mom is is such a wise and understanding person. I, I was reading a story about three archaeologists. They were digging on a tell over there in in the area of Iraq, and as they were digging around the ancient ruins of Babylon. One of them found a lantern and began to rub it just out of jest, and a genie appeared. And the genie tells these three archaeologists, I will grant you three wishes. What would you would like to have? I will give it to you. But remember, you must understand you face consequences for the choices that you make. Well, the first archaeologist, he said, I wish to be five times wiser than I am right now. And, and the genie uh, performed his magic, as it were, and the man began uh, spitting out all kinds of Shakespearean, uh, Shakespearean quotes. And then the second archaeologist says, I choose to be ten times wiser than him, the other archaeologist. And so the genie worked his magic, and uh, the second archaeologist, he starts speaking in fluent Latin. I mean, he can just speak Latin, and he's speaking in Greek and several other languages that he really didn't know. Well, it came to the third archaeologist, and the genie asked him, Sir, what would you like to ask? And this man, looking at the other two, was so greedy. He said, I want to be a hundred times wiser than those men. And the genie reminded him, reminded him, look, understand there are consequences with choices that you make in life. And the archaeologist says, I understand, perform the magic. And so he did. And after the, re after the request, the man's wish came true, 
and the genie had turned him into a woman. Um, and women are very smart, aren't they? Very wise. And uh, boy, this is a wise mother. You know, she could have asked something for herself, but she's thinking of her children. And we'll find out exactly what it is that she's asking in the evening service. But I want us to consider what had transpired earlier to this text. If you were to go back and read in Matthew chapter 19, you'd get an understanding of why this mother was burdened and begging or desirous and craving for this request to be answered of the Lord Jesus. Back in Matthew chapter 19, remember the story, it's the rich young ruler who comes to talk to Jesus. He wants to know how to be saved. Jesus tells him, understanding and knowing his heart, that he was a man given to material possessions. And he tells the young man, he says, well, let me ask you about the law, if you kept the law. And the young man says, I've kept it. From a youth, I've kept it. And then Jesus says, okay, go and sell everything that you have. And you remember the story, the young man was grieved. You see, there was something that he loved more than the Savior. He loved things. He had an issue of idolatry. And he couldn't give those things up. And you remember the young man walks away. And the disciples begin to question Jesus about this young man and his spiritual standing. And then the Lord mentions to him about the importance, mentions to the disciples the importance of giving things up for the Lord's sake, for his will and work. And Peter makes this comment to him. He says, Behold, I've forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus says, verse 28 of Matthew 19, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the, this generation when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Well, thinking about these words, these prophetic words, no doubt the disciples were running back through their mind the promises that had been given, particularly to the Jewish nation, to Abraham's seed, that they would inherit the land forever, Genesis 13, as well as chapter 17, that the nation would be regathered to the promised land, uh, and, and there would be great conversions of, of Jewish people to, to the Messiah, and the kingdom would re be restored. You can read about it in Deuteronomy 30, uh, Ezekiel 20, as well as chapter 37, and then in Micah chapter 4, and then there's the prophet prophecies that were given to, to David back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, that David's throne would be reestablished with the Messiah, a ruling and reigning on David's throne. And you can read other chapters, Isaiah 9, Isaiah 11, Jeremiah 23, Ezekiel 37. These things were running through their minds, as well as through a mother's mind. Is it any wonder that these sons would ask and that their mother would ask for them to be seated at the left and the right hand side of the Messiah? Now let me pause here for a moment and say this. Let me, let me, let me help moms and dads, especially moms. Hey, there is nothing wrong with being ambitious and desirous for your children as you seek the Lord's will for their life and pursue that biblical desire and, and ambition biblically. Uh, you know, we find there's ambitions or desires in the scriptures that we ought to have. How about 1 Corinthians 9.24, Paul writing to the church, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain? Run your Christian life that you may be blessed and honored with a crown of faithfulness. 1 Corinthians 12, 31. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And that refers to love. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 4. One, follow after charity, pursue that, be ambitious and desirous to show agape love. You go to 
1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 12, which says, Even so ye, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Hey, there's an ambition. There's a desire that we all ought to have. Paul said personally, here's a desire personally that he exemplifies for us. He says, I press toward the mark, toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. These are great godly ambitions or desires that we ought to have. Hey, moms, that you ought to have for your children. That you could exemplify to your children. You know, we read throughout the Bible about mothers that had ambitions and desires for their sons. How about Sarah for her son Isaac, or Rebecca for Jacob, or Jochebed for Moses, or Hannah for Samuel, Bathsheba for Solomon, and even, yes, even Mary, the mother of Jesus, had an ambition for her, her son. You can find it there in John chapter 2. Read it, verse 4. Mom, what kind of ambitions, what kind of desires do you have for your child or your children? You know, a lot have an academic or an athletic ambition or desire for their kids. That they'll, 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 they'll get uh, some kind of scholarship to a state school. Some have an ambition for their child to become first chair in the orchestra or to become a, a, a world-renowned uh, vocalist. Or some have an ambition and desire uh, for their child to have a lucrative job position after they graduate from college. I like what one man had to say. Don't allow the good and the better to become the enemy of God's best for your child's life. Hey, what is the best that God has for your child? And as parents, are we ambitious about our children concerning their spiritual maturity, their time they spend with the Lord, the time that they spend reading His Word and in prayer? Do we help lead them to that because we are ambitious and desirous that they will develop that? as a part of their life? How about spiritual ministry? Are we ambitious and desirous that they are part of the local church and involved in serving? Not because they have to, to get some kind of credit for a school requirement. But we really want them to because of our heartbeat for Christ and they see that unfeigned faith, that real, genuine faith, and that we're desirous that they would have the same. I wonder what kind of ambitions we convey to our kids when we forsake the assembling of ourselves as the manner of some is, Hebrews 10.25. What's happened to our mean mothers who say, you know what, there's something more important than watching the wonderful world of Disney on Sunday night or the NFL playoff. Oh, for more godly, ambitious mothers. Many of you know about the story of William Borden. He lived from 1887 to 1913. He was born into a very wealthy family. In fact, he was born a millionaire. But wonderfully, he was placed in a Christian home. He wasn't always Christian at the roots. But as a young boy, his mom got saved. His dad had come to know Christ. And from a child, a young child, as Mrs. Borden was greatly burdened, she dedicated, consecrated William to the Lord. Well, he would place his trust in Christ as his Savior as a seven-year-old boy under the preaching of R.A. Torrey at Moody Church, which is still there in Chicago today. As a boy in grade school, each day before leaving his home, he and his mother would drop to their knees for a time of prayer, asking that the will of God would be done in his life. 
after his high school graduation in 1904, his parents sent him on a, on a trip around the world. Could you imagine? What a graduation present. <laughs> While he was traveling, he wrote the following letter on February 26, 1905, while in a hotel room in the nation of India. This is the exact words from that letter. Dear Mother, I have just been reading over some of your letters and enjoying them so much. I do not expect to get any more until we reach Cairo. Walt and I have a Bible study together every day when possible, and I enjoy it very much. He's able to point out many things that are new to me, and I'm beginning to see that a wonderful storehouse of things are in the Bible. I pray every day for all my dear family. I also pray that God will take my life into his hands and use it for the furtherance of his kingdom as he sees best. I feel sure that he will answer my prayer. It strengthens me to know that you're also praying for this. I have so much of everything in this life, and there are so many millions that have nothing and live in darkness. I don't think it's possible to realize it until one sees the East. I know it's not easy and not an easy thing to serve the Lord, but others have been able, and there's no reason why I should not. And then he has the reference to this verse, Mark 10, 27, at the conclusion, which states, with men it is possible, uh, it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. You know, overwhelmed by the idolatry and the darkness of men's hearts that he observed in many of those foreign countries that he visited, Borden surrendered to God's call upon his life as a missionary as a 17-year-old. His father, however, didn't want him to commit himself to any such work or ministry until giving some time to really settle in on what God's will would be for him. But for Mrs. Borden, her desire for her son, his response to the call of missions was the answer to many a prayer and preparation that she had made. Though he was a, wit a millionaire, William seemed to realize always that he must be about his Heavenly Father's business and not wasting time in pursuit of amusement. Upon his graduation from Yale College, Borden turned down some high-paying job offers, and instead he headed off to Princeton Seminary in New Jersey, where he would finish his studies preparing for the ministry. During that time, he divested himself of all his wealth and finally would set sail on December 17, 1912, for Egypt. It would be there that he would seek to learn how to reach Muslims and then make his way to China and work with the China Inland Mission. No reserves and no retreats for this young man. Why? Well, a number of things impacted him. But if you have ever read the book uh, written by Mrs. Howard Taylor, you're going to find much of this book has letters from his mother that were a huge impact on this youth. And so I bring you back in conclusion to the verse, verse 20. Mother, the mother desiring a certain thing of him Mom, what is it that you desire of the Lord Jesus Christ for your children? Maybe you ought to take some time and write those things down today. Maybe you can only list two or three. The first one that comes to my mind is that all your children would come to trust Jesus Christ as Savior. And if your children haven't done that yet, you continue to pray and persevere in presenting the gospel to them as you have family worship. Dad, you lead in that family worship. You be, you be like a mean mother. You be like a mean dad. And you make sure they're under the gospel, whether it's at home or in the local church. But you keep pointing them to the cross. Hey, secondly... Would one of your requests perhaps be 
that they would yield themselves completely to Christ. As Romans 12 says, that they would be they would be stirred and moved by the mercies of God and that they would surrender themselves completely lock, stock, and barrel, as we would say, as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is only to be their reasonable service. Jesus asked the question, What wilt thou? Hey, Mom, Jesus is asking the question of you. What wilt thou? Let's pray. Lord, children are such a special gift, as we know from Psalm 127. You've told us that they're a heritage that you give to us and that they're a reward. Amazing to think that we can procreate Angels can't do that. Only human beings can. What a privilege is ours that two people can come together from such diverse backgrounds and and from those two come one? Amazing. Amazing to look into the faces, look into the eyes of these children, some of which are getting married this summer. Lord, we think of Natalie Pierce and the shower that's going to be uh, presented for her this afternoon here at the church. God, many years ago, just a little girl. Uh, Lord, uh, these children grow quickly. As arrows in the hands of a mighty man, how will we direct them? And may our, our mothers today, Father, not be weary in well-doing. I pray that we as fathers, that we will be helpful to mothers in their task and their responsibilities and that we would remember that ultimately we have the leadership in the home. God, would you bless our mothers, help them, encourage them. May we share love with them. I pray for the children today. As I mentioned earlier, every one of us here had a mom. Trust you'll spend time with your mom today on the phone, encouraging her, sharing your love with her. And if you cannot do that because she's parted in some way, maybe she's gone home to heaven, she's gone, that you would get on your knees today and thank God for the mother that you had. Say, I didn't know her. Thank God she gave you birth. And thank God from whom all blessings flow. And we make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so we conclude. There is a, a song that uh, we have at the end of the service, a song that Mac and Beth sing. It's called A Simple Offering. I trust you'll listen to the words, especially uh, one of the statements that's made in the song. It says, help me give you anything, everything, holding nothing back from you. Dad and moms, don't hold your children back from Christ. Give him your children. Have a great day. We'll look to see you back tonight. We'll finish this message. We'll look at the second of two points. The second point is the master's answer. What will he tell Salome about these two boys and the request she has for them? All right, we'll talk to you later. Have a great afternoon and a happy Mother's Day to you. was just a little boy. He had just a little food. He was just another nameless face among a multitude. There were thousands in the crowd that day, and he just a youth. How could anyone have guessed how he'd be used? He'd be used. A heart of faith, a little much, a willing, eager lad. It wasn't it wasn't big, but it was a
Good day. 